You may have heard the story about a man who was walking along a, a, a mountain trail and he was near a cliff when suddenly he slipped and he, he fell over the edge. And uh, miraculously, he was able to, to grab onto a branch, but he found that his, his grip was slipping. So he cried out, he looked up and he cried out. He said, is anybody up there? Can anybody hear me? And then he heard, heard this voice, he says, yes, I'm here. Who is that? It's the Lord. Lord, help me. Do you trust me? Yes, of course I trust you, Lord. Please help me. Good. Then let go of the branch. What? Let go of the branch. Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> it's, it's not always easy to discern God's call in your life, God's voice in all the noise around us. But when God does speak, are we open and willing to do what he has to say? Are we open and willing to answer his questions? We're exploring some of the questions that, that Jesus asked. Uh, as I said last week, every good teacher, we know this, every good teacher knows how to ask good questions. And what we find in Jesus is, is someone who knew how to ask good questions. Asking questions was a central part of his, his ministry and his teaching. Of course, he also taught through parables. He also taught through healing. And today's question, we find, leads to a healing. As a matter of fact, in, in the passage that Robin just shared with us, the only words of Jesus is in the form of this question. What do you want me to do? for you. Now, interestingly, we, we find that this is not the only time in Matthew when, when Jesus asked this question and heals the blind. Back in Matthew 9, we find that Jesus asked this same question and healed two blind men near Capernaum. But what we find this morning is, is something interesting, especially if you're a student of the Bible. We find Jesus' question in Matthew 20. It presents an interesting conundrum, an interesting dilemma for students of the Bible because we, we find that Mark and Luke also recognize the significance of this question. They all three report this incident uh, in Jericho, which is the last stop before they arrive in Jerusalem. Jesus asks this identical question in Mark 10 and in Luke 18, but the details around it are slightly different. We just heard Matthew's account that this question of healing took place as they were leaving Jerusalem, or I'm sorry, as they were leaving Jericho, and it involved two blind men. In Mark's testimony, this encounter, this question, this healing takes place as they were leaving Jericho, but the details are different. It involves one blind man, and this blind man has a name. We may be familiar with him. His name is Bartimaeus. Luke's version of this involves Jesus' question and healing. It includes one blind man. However, it occurs in, in Luke as they're approaching Jericho. Now, you don't have to look very far to find people poking holes and questioning the validity of the entire Bible based on these few differences. However, whether there was one or two 
blind man, what, what, whichever gate this occurred at, the whole point of the story is that Jesus healed someone or a couple someones of their blindness. That's the point of the story. If all three Gospels had reported the exact same circumstances, cynics, and there are many, would have accused them of collusion. So the whole point of this is that Jesus healed somebody or somebodies of their blindness. So thus ends the apologetics portion of this sermon. And so let's get back to Jesus' question. We're going to look at this from the perspective of the blind men, or the blind man or the blind men, as the case may be. But in Matthew's version, there are two blind men. And so Matthew writes, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they shouted out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. In their need, in their want, in their, in their blindness, they shouted out. And what we, we learn here, number one, is that the blind men knew who to go to for help. And apparently they had to be persistent. When the crowd shushed them, they became more determined. They, they shouted louder. Have mercy on us, Lord, son of David. And if, if you can't tell, I, I, just, I just love this passage. I love this story. Because the question that I have won't be answered until someday when I'm sitting with Jesus and I say, okay, tell me about this. That's my version of heaven. And so my question is, who told these men about Jesus? How did, how did they know who to cry out to? Someone, someone told them that, that this Jesus, who may or may not come along someday, may be a source for their healing. And so I think the, the, the question for us is, do you know who to go to for help? Do you know who to go to for help? And if, if you do, have you told others where to go to for help? Think about this. We're, we're all at, 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 at different points in our lives. We're, we're either in need of the help or we can be a source for someone to point to somebody for their source of help. I couldn't find who said this, but the quote popped into my mind, we are beggars helping other beggars find bread. And I mentioned Matthew 9, and this, this same story appears there. Two blind men who came to Jesus using the identical phrase, have mercy on us, son of David. But when you read on, we find that Jesus did heal them of their blindness according to their faith. Faith, They're according to their faith. There's some validity to that. But interestingly enough, we find that faith is never mentioned here. He asked, what is it you want me to do for you? But before you do that, have you said the sinner's prayer? Before you do that, do you believe? Maybe the point of all this is that Jesus responds to the need before even asking about faith. Jesus was the one, remember Jesus is the one who, who said that faith the size of a mustard seed is big enough and enough to move mountains. The blind beggars outside Jericho in Matthew 20 knew who to go to for help. But also, secondly, they knew what their problem was. And that may sound oversimplistic. Of course they knew what their problem was. 
They couldn't see. They were physically blind. That's, that's the entire reason they're sitting outside the city gates of Jericho, begging for a morsel of bread or a stray coin. Jesus' question strikes to the core of their being. Jesus' question strikes to the core of our being because it's so personal. Just as our relationship with Jesus is personal. He wants that relationship with you. He wants to hear from you. And so he asked, he asked this question, this eternal question, what, what do you want me to do for you? Because he doesn't presume to know what the blind men really want or need. Of course, he, he knew their hearts. He already knew, but, but the power, the power is in the question. The power is in the naming. So the, the question that it begs for us today is, do you know your problem? Every addict knows that the first step toward healing is to name the problem. Name the hurt, name the grief, name the damage, name the addiction, name the sin. Because today we have this powerful personal question from Jesus, what do you want me to do for you? There's great power in this question. All of Jesus' power is represented in this question. All his goodness, all his compassion, all his character are reflected here. Finally, the blind men knew what to ask for. Lord, open our eyes. Let our eyes be opened. We want to see. Jesus' question today, it's a response to prayer. And so when, when, when God provides the answer to prayer, do you know what to ask for? Stop and think about this for a moment. Because I've had to. I've been guilty of this. How specific do you get in your conversations with God? Because it's easy for us to become very ritualistic in our prayers. I try to guard against that when I write the prayer for the pastoral prayer. But however, if you listen to that, that prayer tends to be very general. Prayers for community and prayers for the state and prayers for the nation. And so what many people do, I find, is, is they model that prayer in their own prayer life. And they end up with very generalized prayer that goes something like, Lord, just, 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 God bless our family, and God bless our kids, and, and God bless Aunt Susie, and God bless Uncle Harry. And, and, and then we revert to the tiny Tim prayer that just says, Lord, just, 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 God bless us, everyone. Now, don't get me wrong, blessings are a great thing, but, but the issue is how do we recognize those blessings when, when they arrive? And how do we know that God has done something to bless us? And so the invitation is here is to be specific. Don't be afraid to ask. For years, I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to win the lottery? And I'm hanging there by a thread, and, and God said, buy a ticket. <laughs> I, I still haven't done that. What, what would have happened? What would have happened when Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? What would Jesus have done if the two blind men had simply responded, Lord, we want you to bless us? They didn't ask for a blessing. They knew specifically what to ask for. Lord, let our eyes be opened. 
There's, a, there's an old Syriac version of, of this story, an old manuscript that adds a phrase, adds a so that. Lord, let our eyes be open so that we may see you. Now that's, I, I love that phrase. It's not in the original manuscript. But it reminds us that when, when, when Jesus touched their eyes and their heels, that they were healed, the very first person they would have seen was Jesus. And, it, and isn't that what we all want? To see Jesus? And so Matthew tells us that Jesus moved with compassion. He touched their eyes. Immediately, they regained their sight. And of course, this is key, and followed him. That's key because that happens in all three versions of this, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They were healed, and their response was to follow Jesus immediately. And so do you know where to go to for help? Name your problem. Do you know what to ask for? And so as we prepare ourselves to come to the table of grace, think about your own heart. Come to the table recognizing your own spiritual darkness in need and call on Jesus. Ask Jesus to open the eyes of your heart so that you may see and follow him. There's a wonderful and, and beautiful prayer that Robin read earlier from Ephesians 1. Paul prays this, this prayer. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. When you call out, when you ask Jesus to open the eyes of your heart, he has the same reaction for you. He moves with compassion. And he will touch you. He will heal you. He will provide you with the sight you need. And you will join in the chorus of John Newton's hymn, I once was lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. Let us come to the table of grace.